Well, welcome to the fourth in our little series on church architecture and spirituality, when we're going to be looking at the earliest Christian assemblies and the earliest known uh, Christian churches. Now, as we discovered when we discussed vocabulary, there was no purpose-built church in the Roman Empire, or indeed anywhere, until roughly 300 years after Christ's ministry. And the reason for this, uh, or the reasons for it, are many. First of all, the very earliest Christians might not have felt the need to construct these elaborate buildings because it just simply wasn't worth it. If Jesus was about to return, as was the expectation in Paul's earliest letters, the effort to create permanent structures uh, wouldn't make any sense. Secondly, according to the Bible, the apostles and the earliest Christians continued to meet in the temple uh, in Jerusalem until it was destroyed by the Romans about 30 years after Jesus' death and resurrection, um, its destruction wouldn't have made a huge difference to the Christians who were already drifting away as a separate sect that taught that Jesus' crucifixion uh, meant that the curtain of the temple had been torn in two and the old order of sacrifice had been replaced. And the temple at Jerusalem was destroyed just as the new temple of the church, the body of Christ, according to Christians, uh, was beginning to spread throughout the world. According to John's Gospel and Paul's letters, members of the Jesus movement also continued to meet in the synagogues that were scattered throughout the Jewish diaspora. And they were following Jesus' example uh, in meeting in those synagogues, um, as his first sermon was in the synagogue in Capernaum that you can see uh, here in those lower basalt stone um, uh, boulders and the floor of the synagogue where Jesus preached. Um, these buildings were surrounded on the interior, uh, they were sort of halls with a low bench around the edge for people to sit on. This is an archaeological dig uh, in northern Israel, uh, the very early synagogue. And they were sometimes decorated uh, with very beautiful mosaics like this one uh, showing the crossing of the Red Sea. Thirdly, Christianity wasn't a legally constituted religion in the Roman Empire until the early 300s, that is, over 250 years after Jesus' ministry. Um, Christians were periodically persecuted. They most certainly wouldn't have been allowed to construct buildings for mass assembly, uh, which looked like something that imitated a pagan temple or, a, say, an official headquarters. Fourthly, the principal form of Christian worship for the earliest church was gathering in a private house for a meal. And this means that a community of people took precedence over a material building. Um, the, the temple of God, in fact, is the community of the faithful disciples of Jesus, not a building. And if material buildings do have any significance, they're important because of the community of people that uses that building. What they do uh, when they come together to celebrate this sacrament of communion and hear the stories about Jesus is far more important than where that assembly takes place. So what do we know about the meeting places of the Jesus movement from the New Testament itself? Groups of believers who came from a wide variety of classes, they met together for worship in private houses. They thought of themselves as the ecclesia, that is a group of people who are called out, according to the Greek, or distinguished uh, from the unbelievers. Uh, the marks of an identity of this group were baptism and the celebration of the Eucharist. And they were held together, not just through their common stories, but also through social care and hospitality. It seems that they met in a synagogue or in the temple, and then they went on afterwards to private homes for the ceremony of the breaking of the bread. We know this from Acts chapter 2. Uh, the groups of people who formed this ecclesia uh, included Gentiles as well as Jews. They were slaves, they were free, male, female, young and old, etc. 
Now, they weren't just polite dinner parties where good discussions were held and some wine and bread uh, shared and stories of Jesus uh, told, although those were all vital components of the dinners. Uh, Paul tells us that the church in Corinth was a, a very sort of vigorous assembly indeed. They spoke in tongues and they prophesied. Uh, and social classes seem to have started to assert themselves. And in fact, Paul says that the wealthy would meet and eat uh, before the riffraff uh, Christians arrived. And he calls this an abuse of the common table. You can see here uh, in an extract uh, from uh, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, uh, he blames them uh, for showing contempt for the church of God and humiliating those Christians who have nothing. Uh, so when you come together to eat, wait for one another. And if you're hungry, eat at home so that when you come together, it won't be for your condemnation. Uh, means that uh, the purpose of these dinners was not necessarily to have a slap up feast. Uh, it was actually to commemorate with bread and wine uh, the crucifixion and resurrection of Christ. In 1 Corinthians uh, 16, verse 19, uh, Paul talks about the churches of Asia and the church of Aquila and Prisca that met in that particular couple's house. And this seems to be the origin of what came to be called the Domus Ecclesiae, the house church. Uh, the owners of houses frequently had their names uh, in the Roman Empire inscribed in a stone over the front door of their dwelling. And perhaps that's why we have Prisca and Aquila named as the church of those, uh, those two people. And of course, these churches soon developed leaders, the bishops, deacons, elders. There were also uh, apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors, teachers, we hear this in Ephesians chapter 4, and perhaps in time, the leaders became more important than the person um, who owned the house that they met in. One of the reasons that people believe that women uh, began to play a lesser role in these churches, the, the domestic space of meeting around a meal uh, became a more formal place of assembly with leaders rather than hosts or hostesses. And this is one of the many, many ways in which architecture and church meeting spaces in general have had a very profound effect on Christian beliefs and practices, not just on the shape of the liturgy either, but as we can see in this example uh, of the person who was going to lead it, the leader rather than the hostess or host. Acts uh, also speaks of the church in the upper room in Troas, where there were many lamps lit. Here's a little extract from uh, Acts chapter 20. There seems to have been rather a crowd in a very small room, uh, so much so that some people had to stand or sit uh, on window ledges uh, from which this young man fell uh, and was rescued from his fall by Paul. You can see on the right hand side there what those uh, meeting, uh, those houses might have looked like. Uh, this is an insula or an apartment block, uh, and the third floor uh, would be just up here in this, uh, in this, this level here. So you can see a, a fall from there would be pretty nasty. Um, so the fuller these private meetings became, perhaps as the movement grew, uh, the more important it was to find bigger meeting rooms that were capable of hosting the teaching and the meal. Here you can see in uh, Ostia near Rome, uh, the remains of these insulae. Uh, you can see that the walls are very thick, they're, they're multi-storied, uh, uh, so Christians would have been very used to going into these sorts of uh, buildings to have their um, agape meals. So what did they look like uh, on the inside and what went on there? There's a Greek vase uh, here. You can see that people ate uh, reclining. Uh, there was music played. There were low tables here, as you can see, uh, where the food was uh, placed and it was often uh, served like this um, by servants that you can see here on the right. Uh, here's an, another example of this uh, with the people lying flat. I think this is uh, a Minoan uh, um, frieze from much earlier than the Greek pot uh, that we just saw. Uh, 
This is a plan of a typical uh, Roman house. Uh, you can see here that there's an entryway at the very bottom coming in from the street. Very often these houses also had uh, workshops or shops inside them here that also opened onto the street. Uh, we think that maybe um, Paul, the tent maker, uh, um, plied his trade in a house a little bit like this and also held the agape meals in them. Uh, as you go through into the house, you get the impluvium open to the sky here uh, in letter C, uh, where the water would uh, drop down from the roofs that sloped inwards uh, and the big atrium, which is an open courtyard, very often with columns around it, uh, uh, around the peristyle there. Uh, and then at the back here, marked G, you can see the triclinium, the dining room. So if this dining room was full, for instance, uh, uh, for the agape meal, people could have flooded out into the more open areas there uh, around the peristyle. Here's the House of the Tragic Poet uh, in Pompeii. And once again, you can see uh, just exactly how these uh, uh, houses are, are classically laid out with the entrance to the right, the shops opening onto the street, and the triclinium or dining room there at the back next to the kitchen. Uh, there were also other little dining rooms sometimes, as we can see here, the Excedra, the summer dining room, uh, or sometimes they would be a smaller dining room for a less grand occasion. Here's the House of the Lovers in Pompeii, where you can see that we're looking down here on the peristyle uh, that surrounds the impluvium here with a little uh, garden in, in the middle of it and an upper story here. Uh, on the interior, they were very often elaborately decorated with mythological scenes or hunting scenes or scenes of the four seasons, for instance. Um, and uh, here you can see a mosaic floor in the triclinium. They were called triclinians because often they would have three... Uh, uh, I don't know, chaise longue, I don't know quite how we describe these things, uh, three sort of bed-like reclining uh, benches that people would recline on to eat uh, with a small table, as you can see, in the middle. And here we have a biclinium with just two couches uh, for eating for a more intimate uh, and smaller sort of, uh, sort of meal. Sometimes you can tell if you're digging something up uh, that it's the dining room because you can see pictures of fruit and what have you on the walls. And sometimes on the floor, in a sort of jokey way, you'll have the remains of the meal. So you can he see here the little husks, there's a dropped fig and a little mouse gnawing away uh, at, uh, at what looks like could be a grape or something on the floor. We have a chicken leg and uh, some other... Uh, shells of, uh, of, of uh, seafood on the ground. Uh, here is a, a skeleton of a fish. And uh, as you can see at the top there from Sepphoris, we have a triclinium mosaic. So you can see that the early Christian agape meals, uh, as we can see from the, uh, the, uh, from the um, catacombs in Rome too, uh, may have taken this sort of form. Here's an interesting example from Hinton St. Mary. It's a mosaic with the face of Christ in the centre, probably uh, from the 4th century AD. They've suggested that this could be a triclinium because if you look around the edges there, you've got the four seasons in the corners uh, with fruit and flowers uh, either side of their heads. Uh, and on the borders, uh, top and bottom, side to side, you can see little hunting scenes. Here's the face of Christ a close-up of it uh, in the middle of that uh, of that mosaic. Now, though it was possible to celebrate the agape meal in private houses and clubs, baptisms were performed by preference in running water, which uh, implies an outdoor setting. And an example of this survives in Abu Ghosh, which is a possible site for Emmaus just outside Jerusalem, now a Benedictine monastery. It has on the right there, and fortunately the picture is a little blurred, it has a spring-fed baptismal pool, uh, a spring that was perhaps used for baptism in the earliest days and then later incorporated into a church that became this Benedictine uh, monastery. When the 
church began to be persecuted uh, more rigorously. Um, worship meetings developed around the shrines of the martyrs and perhaps in the sites of their burial uh, in the catacombs in Rome. Um, I believe this is a, perhaps a little later here. In about 150 AD, uh, a Roman prefect asked Justin Martyr where the Christians had a habit of meeting, and Justin's answer was rather vague. He said that they gathered together in different members' houses. Now, the large houses of wealthier members were probably preferred since they could accommodate the greater number of people. And Justin also says that on the day which is called Sunday, we have a common assembly of all who live in the cities or in outlying districts. Uh, though these larger houses of merchants, etc., were situated in the large towns, it's possible that people from the surrounding countryside would come in for this special Sunday meal. Christians also began to hold property in common, thanks to this chap here, Alexander Severus, the Roman emperor. Uh, legal developments in the Roman Empire meant that this was uh, suddenly possible. They could hold property in common. Uh, in fact, we know that in Rome, the Christians competed with a tavern keeper for the purchase of a house that actually belonged to the state. Um, the emperor decided, in fact, in favour of the Christians because he thought that a place of worship uh, was a better use for a piece of his property uh, than a place for drinking. And in 250, so before Christianity uh, was legalised, another early Christian writer, St Cyprian, uh, mentions of this large room in Carthage in North Africa uh, with a raised platform at one end, probably for the proclamation of the word the, and the seating of the leaders of the community. And he said there should be a place uh, to seat the bishop in the east, uh, surrounded by his or her, perhaps, uh, presbyters. And lay people were arranged with the men in front, the women behind, and the young girls on one side and the widows on the other. Um, the earliest evidence for a house adapted specifically for Christian worship that's been discovered to date anyway has been excavated in Dura Europus in Syria. Uh, Christianity in that city dated back to about 163. This place is sometimes called the Pompeii of the East. Um, there was a synagogue uh, close by to the Christian house church uh, and various uh, other temples. What you can see on the left here is a ground plan of Dura Europus, and the little orange arrow points to the Palmyrine Gate, uh, the major entrance to Dura Europus, and just underneath it there, uh, to the south of the gate, uh, you can see the, uh, the uh, thing marked Christian House. On the right-hand side of it, you can see an aerial photograph of Dura Europus, and I've put a blue blob uh, over the uh, site of the Christian uh, of the Christian House. So there were various other temples close by. Uh, here we can have a little view of Dura Europus uh, on the banks of the river Euphrates. And here is uh, a picture of the Temple of Bel, or what is left of it, uh, who was a Syrian uh, deity. It was also a, a temple to Mithras and a synagogue too. Now, the building survived because it was built close to the city walls. And these, uh, this is the Palmyra Gate, and the Christian house is just to the right there behind that big um, remaining uh, standing wall, uh, which protected it uh, essentially from destruction. A um, hundred or so years before Constantine declared Christianity uh, to be a legal religion, a house was adapted by the Christian community in that town for worship. Uh, it's built around a courtyard, like most houses in that part of the world, and you can see here what's left of it today. Behind is the city wall, uh, and you can see on the right there's a sort of uh, uh, opening with two walls. I'll describe what all of this is about in, in, in a moment. In the middle there's the remains of a doorway, and to the left there's another room that's rather bigger than the room uh, on the right uh, of that uh, doorway. Now, it's clear from archaeological evidence that the Christians removed a partition wall 
to create a much larger meeting space for an assembly on the left-hand side there. It's the size of a fairly roomy garage for one car, so it's not enormous, perhaps large enough for about 60 or 70 people in total. Uh, there was a raised platform, as you can see there, uh, at the bottom of the assembly room, uh, probably for the same purpose that we heard about in Carthage for the seating of the dignitaries. And the baptistry up there, top right-hand corner, can be identified by a sort of raised pool um, uh, the, uh, that stands in an arch that's decorated with uh, stars. As you can see here, here's a reconstruction uh, of what that might have looked like. Um, the walls of the baptistry were decorated with paintings. Uh, uh, here's the baptistry itself. You can see that it's uh, those sort of columns that look like flowing water, and then there are grapes and pomegranate symbols of eternal life, I suppose, and um, uh, the fruitfulness of paradise uh, painted on the arch uh, above. This is heavily reconstructed. Uh, I think I might have a picture or two of what it looked like before restoration. So the walls were decorated with paintings, as I've mentioned, including the Good Shepherd. You can just about see him there with a sheep on his back. And then that uh, funny little grid on the bottom left is actually Adam and Eve. Uh, there's also a beautiful wall painting of the women bringing the spices to the tomb. You can see the pots in their hand and the uh, torches that they're carrying um, uh, in the night to take the, the spices to the tomb. Um, you can also see uh, on these walls uh, Christ and Peter walking on the water there on the bottom, uh, uh, on the left with the disciples in the boat and the healing of the paralytic on the right. You can see him taking up his bed and uh, walking. Um, other paintings include uh, David and Goliath. And what's perhaps uh, some dispute about what's going on in this picture, uh, it's clearly a woman and she's clearly got a jug in her hand and something down below uh, in that little circle there. Uh, people think maybe this could be um, uh, Mary Magdalene. It, it could be the woman at the well, and some have suggested that it's Mary, the mother of Jesus herself, at the wedding of Cana uh, in Galilee. Um, curiously enough, the meal, uh, the room where the Agape meal was held, uh, was decorated only with a frieze of the pagan god Bacchus. Unfortunately, I couldn't find a picture of this. Uh, people have wondered why the baptistry was so elaborately decorated, and the actual meeting room where the agape meal was held was hardly decorated at all. Um, perhaps the, uh, it's because the focus of Christian identity was initiation through baptism in this separate room. Uh, either that or they just didn't get round to decorating the room uh, because they prioritised the baptistry before a persecution broke out in 260 or so uh, and the building was abandoned. It probably looked like any other house from the outside, but once you entered the courtyard, uh, here's the courtyard uh, entrance uh, uh, in the foreground, the baptistry up there, top right-hand corner, that arch there uh, going into what might have been an instruction room. Uh, there's also evidence that there was a little library there uh, with some Christian texts in it. Uh, 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 scraps of Christian text have been uh, uh, discovered in the other archaeological digs. Um, but once you went inside this uh, little ordinary looking house from the outside, its purpose would have been uh, pretty clear. The Eucharist uh, would have been celebrated the other side of that arch, uh, just in this area back here. Um, and it was probably celebrated on a long wooden table uh, and everything, including the president's chair, the lectern, uh, would have been movable. So they weren't sort of set in place like a pulpit or something. There were certainly not shrines, they were certainly not temples, um, and the layout looks a little bit like a synagogue with, uh, with common seating, but with the addition of a long dining table uh, in, the, in the middle of it. Um, 
here you can see in this uh, slide uh, the wall paintings from the house church that are displayed today in the Yale University Art Gallery. You'll recognise them now uh, there at the bottom with the women taking the spices uh, to the, uh, the tomb. And up at the top left, the paralytic, top right, uh, we can see uh, uh, Peter and Jesus uh, in the middle. In this sort of greyest picture was the one that we were just talking about, um, the, um, the what might be the woman uh, at the well. But that gives you some sort of idea of the size of these uh, wall paintings. Now, by the late 200s, maybe early 300s, um, these large places of worship began to be called houses of prayer. They could be called the house of God or the house of the Lord or just simply in the church. It's an interesting word, this. In the north, they preferred kiriakon um, uh, or kirioikios, kiri, uh, meaning Lord, and akion here, meaning a house. Uh, and this has come down to us as kirk uh, in Scotland, for instance, or church. Uh, but in the Greek and Latin word, uh, the word uh, world, the word ecclesia was preferred, which is why we have the French église. Uh, the Celtic uh, world too preferred this word, so we have the Welsh eglouis. Uh, in uh, Breton, uh, we get elise, uh, which comes from the same root, uh, and Scottish Gaelic eglise. Uh, and Irish, uh, uh, a Gaelic word for a cathedral is Ardiglais. Now, sometimes the name of the owner of the building, as I've mentioned, was inscribed over the lintel of the front door. And by 300, there were at least 25 buildings uh, it, like this in Rome. Uh, but only the ruins of these places remain very often underneath churches that were built over them at a later date. This is the oldest church in Rome, uh, the oldest basilica. It dates back to 313, so you can see it's been much modified, much decorated uh, since that particular time. So what we know then is that in the earliest centuries, there were very few recognisable church buildings. Uh, Christians used whatever was available to them for meeting rooms uh, with an area for a meal provided. And when they began to build purpose-built churches, it wasn't because they thought the, that God wasn't sufficiently present in those meetings in dining rooms. Believers were already bound together as a body by their beliefs, by their sacramental lives. Uh, and so when the Christian faith became more visible in a wider community, when it was officially adopted by the emperor, the buildings became more visible and they became more fancy and more public uh, as well. And we're going to explore that next time when we look at these uh, wonderful Constantinian uh, basilicas after the legalization of Christianity. So thanks for joining us and uh, I'll see you next time. <laughs>